Hey everybody, I'm back. It's time for chapter three, culture. You have any quotes, Maynard? <laughs> yeah. Finley Peter Dunn said, to most people, a savage nation is one that wears comfortable clothes. Think about particularly men in, in the modern world, you know, where the, the formal attire is a suit coat and tie. Um, you know, I heard one, <laughs> I heard one commentator say, what more can you say about men in Western civilization than look at the tie itself? First of all, if you turn it around this way, it acts as a noose. And second of all, look what it points toward. Once again, male superiority. Ralph Linton said, the child that is born into any society finds that most of the problems confronted in the course of life have already been met and solved by those who have lived before. Well, that is how it appears to a kid because think about it. All the time, the kid's asking questions. Why, 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 why? And just rattle it all off. Kid figures, man, it's already been figured out. Mary Ellen Kelly said, natives who beat drums to drive off evil spirits are objects of scorn to Americans who blow horns to break up traffic jams. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing more effective than blowing a horn to break up a traffic jam. Now, I get it in New York City. In New York City, people don't understand the rules of driving uh, if you're new to the city. So when a red light appears, red light doesn't mean stop. Red light means you keep going to the other line won't let you in anymore. So if you're at a red, if a red light hits and you didn't keep going, you're going to hear somebody behind you hitting that horn going, keep going, you idiot. There's no cops. They can't stop us. <sighs> On the other hand, think about a four mile traffic jam, right? And somebody comes in, uh, you're behind somebody and you think, well, it was traffic jam. Let's get this moving. You start honking your horn. That's going to be really effective in getting the people four miles up to start moving their cars for your sake, right? You keep hitting that horn. You know what that's going to provoke? That's going to provoke the guy in front of you to get out of his car with a gun and blow your head off. Maybe. Okay, culture is from the Latin cultura. Uh, cultura cultura meaning a tilling. Uh, it's the same root for cultivate and agriculture. So you could say, I'm about to, humans cultivate the world. Culture then is the ways of thinking, the ways of acting, and the material objects that together form a people's way of life. So sociologically speaking, culture's meaning has two components, non-material, culture being the beliefs, values, behaviors, ideas created by members of society, the intangible creations of society, uh, the world of ideas, uh, and material culture, which consists of the tangible, physical creations of human society, like Twinkies, computers, and condoms. I always throw in condoms because it always gets a chuckle. Every element of culture is a human product that is subject to change, and only humans rely on culture rather than instinct to ensure the survival of their kind. A.L. Kraber pointed out, we can approximate what culture is by saying that it is that which the human species has and other species lack. This would include speech, knowledge, beliefs, customs, arts and technologies, ideals, and rules. Culture and society are two different concepts. Now, I'm going to show you how brilliant my logic is. Do you know how I know that culture and society are two different concepts? <laughs> They're two different chapters in the book. If they were the same concept, they'd just be one chapter, huh? Yeah, you're probably thinking, whatever I'm paying for this course to get that kind of insight just isn't worth it, is it? Okay, from the structural functional perspective, a society is a system of many different parts that work together to generate relative stability. Now, 
again, after my exhaustive overview of the three paradigms, the three different perspectives in chapter one, hopefully you'll realize that structural functionalism is always about creating stability in society. Remember, it's a conservative approach. What does conservative mean? Conserve things the way they are. So it's like, hey, the way things are is great. Let's keep it going. Um, that's what's kept our, our culture going. That's what's kept our civilization going by following the rules and, and, and creating stability in society. So that's what structural functionalism is all about. Many different parts, all designed to create stability and to keep it going generation after generation. Here's something we'll, we'll get back to in a, another chapter. But Ruth Benedict said, no man ever looks at the world with pristine eyes. He sees it edited by a definite set of customs and institutions and ways of thinking. The point being, we all see the world through our subjective lens. In other words, we don't see the world objectively. We see the world subjectively. Uh, now, we like to think we see the world sub objectively, but we don't. So our pre-existing beliefs uh, and, and well, let me just leave it at that, our pre-existing beliefs about how the world is will always bias how we actually see the world, how the world actually is. So wouldn't it be fun to have a brief discussion question here, you know, to just kind of think a little bit apart from Maynard's exciting lectures. My question to you is, could any species other than humans have societies? Okay, so this is your moment to pause and think. Hmm, could any species other than humans have societies? Hmm, hmm. Well, yes, ants and bees have societies. Why? Because they have social behavior. That fits the definition of society. But again, they can't have culture because they cannot creatively fashion their life patterns. Um, now, I know some people, when I ask this question, class will say, well, what about wolves? No, wolves can, you know, they can change things. All right? they, don't, uh, they don't operate exclusively on instinctoid behavior. Um, people used to say chimpanzees, but now we found that chimpanzees figured out how to use tools. Uh, even certain birds have figured out how to use tools, so to speak. Uh, for example, they'll drop nuts on tops of rocks because it'll break them open. So, but ants and bees are pretty fixed in their behaviors. You know, you got the worker ant, you got the queen ant, and you got the worker bee, and you got the queen bee, and blah, blah, blah. They can't change what they do. It just is the way it is. Uh, so they have societies because they have social behavior, but they can't have culture because they cannot creatively fashion their life patterns. In the human world, there can also be no culture without first having a society. Only when groupings of people first arrange themselves systematically in socially functional patterns can culture evolve. So let me give you an example. Let's suppose we have two uh, groups of students at the college who for I can't imagine what reason no longer want to live in the residence halls. Like, why? Why? Don't you like the drama? Anyway, so they decide they want to get their own place. Okay, so first of all, each realizes she can't afford an apartment on her own. Therefore, they're going to cooperate economically and share an apartment. Okay, so... Uh, a group of four students are going to get an apartment over here, and another group of four students are going to get an apartment over here. Now, we have now formed two societies, right? But no culture yet because they haven't lived together long enough for a culture to evolve. So in time, you find out that the group over here is the party house. Woo! They party on. You know, Monday night's the only night they don't party. Um, anyway... Uh, and do they get good grades? Nah, who cares? They've, they've learned that C's get degrees and it's more important to have a good time while you're in college. And God bless them. Now, the other group over here, their culture is they're the study house. On Friday nights, they're studying too. Why? Because they're probably losers and can't get date. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Forget I just said that. Uh, 
But anyway, so they study, 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 and they're getting good grades, but they don't party. So that's the culture of this place. That's the culture of the, the other place is the party place. But first of all, they had to form a society and live together for that culture to eventually evolve. Now, throughout this course, I will offer you quotes from Mark Twain, also known as Samuel Clemens, uh, who at his time was considered one of the great wits in the world. He said, a human being is the only animal that blushes or needs to. <laughs> Perhaps I should take that one out. Hang on a moment. Mark Twain, you've let me down for the last time. Well, anyway, uh, one time a student in class who was a biology major told me, not true, they found that dolphins can blush. You know, we keep finding out more and more about dolphins. Um, and uh, for example, when and that how intelligent they are, for example, that when they hold elections and the results come in that they don't claim it's fraud with absolutely no evidence whatsoever to support that. Because dolphins have democratic processes that run. Anyway, um, and I thought dolphins actually blush. I'm thinking, what would cause a dolphin to blush? Do they like swim up to a nude beach or something? Just go, oh, oh, oh. that was a dolphin, by the way. Well, you need to know for the exam, the five elements of culture on page 66. Could you go over those, Maynard? Of course. The first is symbols. Anything that carries a particular meaning recognized by people who share a culture. Not symbols, but symbols, S-Y-M-B-O-L-S. -S. Um, now, so in other words, they have symbolic meaning that a culture, everybody in the culture understands. And this is sometimes why we um, create uh, cultural faux pas, as they say, because we go into another culture, we don't understand what it means there, and we're not hip. Like, for example, and you gotta, you gotta stop nodding off here and actually look at the screen. Um, what does this mean here in the United States? It means everything is a-okay, right? Um, now, supposing you are not culturally hip and you go to Germany and the waiter says, you know, was this meal, I, did you enjoy your meal? And you go, but see, in Germany, that's a reference to your rectum, right? And so you use that and go, how was the, how was the meal? And you go like this, he goes, did this affect the tip? See, because you didn't know what you were doing. You didn't know that that's what it means in that culture. Uh, for example, um, in Islamic cultures, uh, if you sit with your leg crossed and you're showing the, the uh, uh, bottom of your shoe, that's considered insulting. Uh, I remember some years ago, uh, I think it was Daddy Bush, not W. He was sitting at dinner with the uh, prime minister from Japan and all of a sudden he just blew lunch, you know, right, right next to the prime, you know, and again, what a cultural faux pas. It, it'd be one thing if you blew lunch like that at a dinner in America, but you just don't do that in Japan. Anyway, kissing is also an interesting case of cultural variation. Now, if you go to Europe, uh, Belgium being a good example, I've been to Switzerland, Germany, Greece, they all do the same thing is you always get kissed three times. It's like air kiss, but it's left cheek, right cheek, left cheek. Um, now this is traditionally, the Japanese and Chinese traditionally kiss only privately, and the Nigerians traditionally do not kiss at all. Hey, and we all know about French kissing, which reminds me of another one of Maynard's amazing anecdotes. Do you wanna hear it? If you don't, just, you know, Fast forward through this section. On the other hand, maybe there'll be a laugh or two here. No guarantees. Okay, so um, back after I had started at Cedar Crest as a full-time professor, uh, I got contacted by my alma mater, Muhlenberg, uh, and asked me if I'd be interested in teaching this course, Social 100 there. They, they uh, lost a professor and needed some adjunct help. And I said, sure. 
so, um, you know, and imagine the shock they had because, again, I wasn't the, I was, I was like the party person, like we just described when I was in college. You know, it was the 1960s, and I wasn't going to miss out. I knew something big was going on, so I was just going to party my way through, again, relying on C's to get degrees, because I had it all figured out. If you graduate with 2.0, you're good to go. Um, however, I shocked everyone by graduating with a 2.3. Huh? Huh? I showed them. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, um, so the shock look of my former my former professor's face when they saw me marching in. Now, in my defense, I did get all A's in sociology, so there. Anyhow, um, so I'm going through the whole semester and I'm sharing uh, an administrative assistant um, that also uh, some of the other adjuncts in that part of the building were using. And so we'd see each other all the time, the adjuncts, and uh, when I was in there, and I would, you know, friendly guy always say hello, and they'd say hello to me, but it was one of those awkward things where we never actually introduced ourselves. Now, as the semester goes on, it gets even more awkward because like, oh, yeah, why'd you wait this long to finally introduce yourselves? But none of us did. Um, and so anyway, um, it's getting near the end of the spring semester, and a couple of senior students come up to me and they say, hey, Maynard, um, there's a wine and cheese party for the seniors and, you know, we're allowed to bring faculty guests. Would you like to bring, be one of our faculty guests? And I said, oh, uh, to a wine and cheese party, huh? You, you do have my interest, but let me ask you this, is it free? And they said, yes. And I said, yes, I'm down. So uh, it happened, uh, I guess it was like four o'clock on a Friday, cleverly timed to be happy hour. And it's about quarter to four and it's in the alumni house. And of course, I'm showing off for the students, you know, waiting for the door to open because it didn't open. Come on, open the door. Let us in here. What are they going to do to me? I, you know, just an adjunct here. I got a job elsewhere and I don't want to I can get away with some crap. Show off for the students. And they're going, yeah, yeah, you tell them, Maynard. Come on. Ah, ha, 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 ha. You're a riot, man. Okay, so the door opens and we go spilling in. And I'd say we're about maybe 15, 20 minutes into the event and I'm already in my second glass of wine with some crackers and cheese, of course. And I'm standing there with a couple of the seniors and uh, uh, gulping, excuse me, sipping delicately on the wine. And in walks the two adjuncts I used to say hello to. Uh, and there were two women who, uh, I know they, they taught in international language. And, uh, so anyway, they get a glass of wine and they recognize me and they come over and stand next to me because they didn't know anybody there either. And uh, so, <laughs> I said to them, I said, you know, this is so awkward. And I said, here we went the whole semester and I never introduced myself. So I apologize for that. I said, but my name is Maynard and I teach in sociology. And may I ask where you teach? I said, I know you're in international languages, but what do you teach? And the one said, well, I teach Spanish. And the other one said, I teach French. And he said, French, huh? I said, hey, you know, I said, I'm an alum of Muhlenberg. And I said, when I was here, I took French too, but I only took it about a couple of weeks, just long enough to learn how to kiss. And then I bagged the course. And at that, she just turns around with disgust and marches right away from me. And the students are all going, <laughs> wow, Maynard. And I'm thinking, what the heck? You know, and so I said, for my benefit and the sake of the students, I, I, I you know, said, hey, hey, hey. I said, listen, I said, I wasn't trying to hit on you or anything. I was just trying to be friendly. And I remarked to the students said, well, I know now where they keep the Eiffel Tower up her ass. Another one of Maynard's amazing anecdotes. And it was true. Okay, well, getting back to the material here, cultural symbols also change over time. Uh, and so uh, what was symbolic in American culture maybe 100 years ago is no longer has that same meaning. Okay, two, a second aspect or, uh, of culture is language. Language is a system of symbols that allows people to communicate with each other. Now, think about words. Words are signs that point to what it is you're trying to express. The, my favorite example is the word love. How can the word love possibly explain what love is or the emotion that's involved with love? So the word love just points to what it is I am trying to express when I say the word love. 
uh, global map 3-1 depicts language and global perspective. Now you will notice how widely, when you look at that, how widely spoken English is as a second language. And the theory on that is after, because of World War II and Americans uh, going to Europe and in Southeast Asia, uh, because of World War II, we rapidly began to spread English. Now, not that the British didn't speak English, they just speak it kind of horribly poorly. Anyway, um, you will notice when you look at that, that the greatest percentage of the world's population speaking just one language is about 20% of the world's population speaks various uh, dialects of Chinese like Mandarin. So my question to you, in case this ever comes up in jeopardy, no extra charge, is what is the world's oldest living language? Want to guess? Yes, you. Latin? No, no, good, good guess. Greek? No, 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 good guess. No, no, no. It's Sanskrit. See, if you think about it, every time I ask this question in class, everybody comes up with Western languages. We forget about Eastern cultures. Sanskrit out of India is the world's oldest living language going back thousands of years. Oh, let's see. Um, to show you how powerful and important language is as a symbol in the Bible, the first thing Adam, Adam and Eve do is name things. In fact, uh, according to the Bible, the first words ever spoken were by Adam. Uh, you'll remember the two of them were nude at that time, and Adam took one look at uh, Eve and went, tatas, and those were the first words ever spoken by a human. It's in the Bible. Go look it up. Language is the most important means of cultural transmission, which is the process by which one generation passes culture to the next. Um, cultural transmission was almost entirely a matter of the oral tradition. Uh, to give you a flavor how effective this was, so in other words, Virgil's Aeneid, uh, the mythic tale of the founding of Rome was presented intergenerationally by oral tradition. Now, I know that to some extent there must be that whisper down the alley effect where things get distorted as it keeps getting passed down. But because this was the main way to transmit knowledge, they prided themselves on the accuracy of their oral transmission. But when it was finally written, it was over 400 pages long, which is a real tribute to how how effective the oral tradition was and how powerful uh, the memory was in passing it down intergenerationally like that. Uh, now billions of books are published uh, each year just in the United States. Now throughout this course I'm going to give you some uh, quotes from, from my list of quotes titled, When Insults Had a Touch of Class to Them. William Faulkner said about Ernest, Ernest Hemingway, in case you don't know, they were both famous authors. William Faulkner said about Ernest Hemingway, he has never been known to use a word that might send a reader to a dictionary. Burn, burn, literary burn there. Okay, now to show you how the content of uh, language and meaning can change over time, uh, Look at the following words, for example, pot. Pot used to be a pot. Now pot refers to a smokable, ingestible substance that's rapidly getting legalized. Uh, grass, crack, gay, bomb. That's the bomb. Pill, bad. Bad used to be bad. Now bad means good. You're bad. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's right. I'm bad. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. In terms of language, there is also a chimp, Kanzi, described in your text, who has learned several hundred words by listening to and observing people. Um, however, there's little evidence that one chimp could teach other chimps to do so. They also found that Kanzi's ability was that of about a two and a half year old human. Now, I think it's only fair that you know this. You're paying tuition. You have a right to know. Um, all colleges under the current circumstances of the pandemic 
uh, are looking for cost saving measures for understandable reasons. And uh, I have an informant on campus who I refer to as Deep Goat, who lets me know what's going on. And uh, my informant told me that um, unbeknownst to the faculty uh, and of course the students is that the administration is secretly training chimps to replace the faculty to save some money. I mean, compare the cost of feeding a chimp to a, a professor's luxurious uh, likes. Anyway, so I'm only pointing out that future presentations, you won't see me anymore. Instead, you'll see Professor Chimp. You know, you'll see Professor Chimp in a nice coat and tie there and, you know, walking, if it was a lecture, I'll be walking in on his knuckles, you know, carrying his briefcase, you know, and instead of my ranting, you'll hear a much more informed ranting. <laughs> and you'll be sitting at home going, whoa, finally, somebody making sense besides Maynard. Wow, this chimp, what are we paying Professor Chimp? Although I got to tell you is, you don't know how Professor Chimp's going to react when you send that email of, Oh, Professor Chimp, my paper is going to be late. And you're going to get a response that goes, -ah 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 So beware, Professor Chimp. Be careful what you wish for. You know, now this whole thing about, you know, have we seen enough Planet of the Apes movies to know that the, the apes are, in fact, learning? Um, and, in fact, it reminds me of one of the... Uh, Here's another one of Maynard's amazing anecdotes. My son and I, who just love the, uh, the, uh, these chimp movies, the Planet of the Apes movies, because they're just really entertaining. Anyway, so we're watching the one, and I forget what the basic premise was, but the, uh, but the general idea was that humans were no longer, uh, they, they, they were, uh, these astronauts were out in space, and I forget what happened like, time passed on earth and they didn't realize how much time had passed when they finally get their way back to earth the chimps have taken over and they don't know it yet so they come crash landing into washington dc and you, you can see the spacecraft bouncing up the, the the reflecting pool right in front of the lincoln memorial they they come to a crash landing and they're going to go in and they're, they, they don't know what's going on. They walk into the Lincoln Memorial and I'm sitting in the theater. And I could not restrain myself because I could see what was coming down the pipe here. And it was, and I, so I yell out, it's going to be ape Raham Lincoln. And sure enough, they go in and sitting on the pedestal is ape Raham Lincoln, right? A chimp. As a, anyway, I guess he had to be there. Uh, but here's my point. Kanzi, when he uh, was on his deathbed, suddenly blurted out, we have been talking for years and we will be taking over. <sighs> Third component of culture is values and beliefs. Values are culturally defined standards that people use to decide what is desirable, what is good what is beautiful, and that serve as broad guidelines for social living. Now, they're not just intellectual judgments. They are emotionally toned cultural judgments about how we should live. And so that's why you don't want to get into values arguments with people because this is my life. I live by these values. You questioning how I live my life? Uh, that's the old axiom about never talk about religion and boy, especially politics, because you're going to get into values. Beliefs are values, excuse me, beliefs. Values are broad principle, principles that support beliefs. Beliefs are specific thoughts that people hold to be true. Again, beliefs, specific thoughts that people hold to be true, not to be confused with facts. Okay, so here's the way it works. It starts with a value or values that lead to certain beliefs that lead to certain policies. Okay, so let me give you an example. First, I want you to look at on page 69, you need to know for the exam, what are the key values of US culture? Uh, these were developed by the sociologist named Robin Williams, not the late delightful comedian Robin Williams. 
Um, and why it's important to know these is one, it's on the exam, but more importantly is we should all know what the primary American values are because you see them played out throughout America in every aspect of life, right? And this would be true of any culture. If you understood the culture's values, just like if you understood the culture's language, because the culture's language is also symbolic, it would tell you a great deal about the culture itself. Okay, so look at that values list for a moment. And I'm going to give you an example of uh, what I was saying previously about how a value leads to a belief that leads to a policy provision. So we're going to work it backwards, okay? So imagine the policy provision on the end of the equation is, uh, let's suppose we had a mandatory retirement policy in America that we determined that as soon as somebody, let's upgrade it a little bit, uh, as soon as somebody turns 70, they just must retire. It's mandatory retirement. Okay, so let's go backwards. What beliefs would possibly support that kind of a policy? Oh, right, 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 you're done thinking already. Uh, okay, so one could be, hey, you know, as soon as people turn 70, they're incompetent. And so they got to move out, which is kind of an interesting notion because it means on their 69th, uh, uh, excuse me, on the day before their 70th birthday, they're apparently competent enough to work, but the very next day they were incompetent. Must have had a hell of a birthday celebration the night before. Anyway, um, so it's not real logical from that standpoint, but another way of looking at it is, and we'll look at this more closely when we get to the section on gerontology old and old age, um, is you could say, you know what, if we had a rule for mandatory retirement, it would really help to have a systematic transfer in society. So if we knew at the beginning of the year that we knew for a fact X number of people are going to retire, it would help the social security system prepare. It would help all the individual companies and corporations prepare to replace you. Uh, and they could project uh, cost savings by hiring somebody who was younger to replace you, blah, 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 blah. So for from the structural functional standpoint of creating stability in society, mandatory retirement could make some sense. Okay, so let's go back one more step. What values would, would be involved in saying, well, there has to be mandatory retirement at age 70? Now, go look at your list of values. I'll wait and suggest certain values that could support that statement because there's more than one that could, that could make sense. I'll wait. Mm. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, still here. Yes, okay, so um, yes, progress. Yes, you could say progress, efficiency, um, uh, you, because the, the assumption being apparently that older people are no longer functional, uh, and it's just progress, you gotta move on, pops, time to be replaced, it's time for you to retire, uh, go on to the next phase in your life, your golden years. Uh, we could say efficiency because you're not as productive as you once were. We got to bring in somebody else, activity and work and efficiency. Um, uh, but I would say the one that's the most uh, prevalent would be the one at the 10th the one, which is group superiority themes. Group superiority themes are the various isms like heterosexism, uh, sexism, racism, ethnocentrism, and this one would be ageism. So a policy like that is discriminating against older people, hence, a re hence the key value here could be ageism, group superiority themes. Now, here's the point of why I went through that exercise. You will notice that most of the debates about policies are on the belief end, right? But that's not the point. You got to go back one more step to the values because unless you change the values that support that particular belief, people are just going to continue to generate more and more erroneous beliefs based on that value. So even if I could prove to you, uh, if, if you believed in ageism and that's why you thought there should be mandatory retirement at age 70, and I can prove to you that logically that doesn't make any sense that that's not true for everybody turning 70, you may go, Okay, fine, but as long as you're ageist and discriminate against the elderly, you will simply generate more beliefs about that support the value of ageism. 
So the locus of change is values, not beliefs. Values create the beliefs. There is also value in consistency. Uh, National Opinion Research Center survey found that 50 respondent, 50% 50 of the respondents in the United States survey thought that a wealthy background was of little importance to getting ahead in life. Yet in a separate question, 59% of the respondents suspected that inequality exists to benefit the rich and powerful. Well, those are two totally contradictory answers in the same survey. So we live with these value inconsistencies and conflicts, which is why policy decisions are such a difficult balancing act, which you're especially seeing right now uh, because we can barely pass anything uh, here in the United States because of the sharp division between liberals and conservatives. Okay, let me give you another example of how values play out in society. What is known as America's pastime? in terms of a sport. That's correct, it is baseball. But what is the most popular sport in America? That's right, it's football, particularly pro football. Now, think about the differences between the two and how they reflect the values in society. Baseball was actually uh, started around, right around the, the end of the Civil War. Uh, and so that was Civil War, North, South, United States, fought over slavery, Union, Confederacy, 1860s, Abraham Lincoln, ring a bell? Nah. See, I go over this because I know a lot of you are kind of fuzzy on history, history and geography, so I'm here to help you. Anyway, so uh, think about the, the inherent qualities of baseball. Baseball, for one thing, you don't know how long the game's going to last. Games could last five, six hours. Some have. Some have lasted longer than that. Um, and because the action is so sparse, um, you got plenty of time to hit the beer stand, which I'm so impressed by at the stadiums now, there's multiple beer stands all serving micro brews. So you can hit the beer stands, you can get food, and you hardly miss any of the action. And what little action there is, is there's TVs out in the food court that you can watch what's going on anyway. Or another thing is you can have a nice conversation with the folks who you're attending the game with and hardly miss anything. You know, you just have to look back and you know, every now and then a play takes place and you watch what's going on. And it's a rather genteel sport. There's no violence involved. Oh, I know every now and then somebody steals a base, but that's about it. You know, compare that to pro football. What has changed in society? We are now mega time oriented, time, 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 time is money, got to be on time, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late for an important date, that's how pro football is, it's like, oh my god, it's a minute and a half left, can they score, well, we're running out of time, ah, we got to accomplish something in the next minute and a half, you know, just like our hectic, crazy lives, and it's uber violent, just like society has become much more violent, uh, at least apart from the civil war and the wars, uh, civil society has become more violent uh, in the past 150 years. So football accurately represents society and the values of society or the aspects of society more so than baseball now does. I'll give you another example. And this gets back to my uh, rap about there is no such thing as value free in teaching. So for example, the very fact that I chose the text I chose represents values because I think it's important for you to know all three paradigms in, in an equally represented way. And so this text does that. Well, that's a value decision on my part. Uh, but it's nothing new. Education has always been filled with teaching values. In fact, that's been the whole point. For example, many of us when we were kids learned about the children's story, the little train that could. Why? Because we're learning. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Little train for you still get chills thinking about because you learn things like perseverance. So school has always been about teaching values. Uh, now the debates between school boards are often what values. So you may have conservative school boards objecting to certain books uh, because they are teaching too liberal values 
and liberals go on and on. Oh, these are the kinds of books because they represent progressive values. So you get this back and forth with school boards too. But the whole point is nobody's saying no teach values. They're arguing which values should be taught. It's all part of our socialization process. Norms, fourth component of culture, are rules and expectations that guide the behavior of members of a society. It's from the Latin norm, meaning a carpenter square, a rule or a pattern. Many norms are proscriptive, what we should not do, and many are prescriptive, what we should do, like a prescription. Um, mores are norms that have great moral significance. For example, later on in the course, we'll talk about the incest taboo as an example of a more. Okay, um, let's see. Later on in the course, we will also uh, get into more on social control, although it's, it's referenced here. Uh, social control is means by which members of a society encourage conformity to norms. Um, we will see this, uh, how it applies to deviance and how it applies to uh, the welfare system. We'll talk more about social control. Now, the things about norms is norms is desc norms describe what is typical in a society. What is the pattern? So, for example, in our society, what is the pattern? In fact, in humanity, what is the pattern? Right handedness or left handedness? Right handedness. I guess it's approximately 10% or left handed. Now, that doesn't mean uh, left handedness is abnormal or weird. It's just not what is typical, not the, the pattern. Now I say this because instead we will use the term, uh, many people refer to homosexuality as abnormal, Homose meaning is something wrong with it, right? We don't think it's left-handed and this is abnormal, we just think it's not the typical pattern. So the typical pattern is heterosexuality, but homosexuality is not uncommon, nor has it been in history, but it's not abnormal, it's just not the pattern, so to speak. It's not the norm. So abnormal isn't necessarily, as we use it, we think of it as more, not necessarily a pejorative term, but sometimes the way we use abnormal is as in a pejorative way, in a negative way, uh, when simply something that is not the norm uh, is simply saying it's just not the pattern, like left-handedness. Fifth component of culture is material culture and technology. We already defined material culture uh, earlier in this presentation. Technology is defined in the text as knowledge people use to make a way of life in their surroundings. It links the world of nature and the world of culture. Uh, the new information technology of the phase we're in in sociocultural evolution, which is known as the post-industrial phase, empowers humanity to manipulate the natural world. Members of post-industrial societies, therefore, risk losing sensitivity to the natural environment and the requirements of living in an ecological system. And I would argue that's exactly what's happened. Think about it for almost all of human history until the last, I don't know, a uh, few hundred years. Uh, well, actually, let's go back further than that. Um, most of our human history has been hunting and gathering societies. So even as pastoral and cultural societies, and even as agricultural societies, if you go back to the founding of this country, uh, or you go back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which was 1750, also, when people say, what, what begins modern times, it's 1750. Uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution marks the beginning of modern times. Prior to that, uh, most people's job was farmer. Right? So we lived in, in, in and around nature. Uh, and so farmers are constantly in tune with nature. Their livelihood depends on it. Uh, all of our human history, we were in tune with nature. But now, in, as we go into the industrial phase and the post-industrial phase, we live in houses. We go to work in cars. We go right from the car into the garage, into the uh, building. We drive on concrete highways. The cities, there's hardly any green anymore. Uh, and so this is how we live. And so 
what we do isn't dependent on, nor do we need to be sensitive to nature. And as a result, we've lost our connection to nature, our natural connection to nature. I'll give you an example. Um, many offices are arranged in cubicles and they're like a big rat's maze. Unless you know where somebody's office is, you'll never find it. Uh, but how do you know your cubicle is different from the next person's cubicle? Because otherwise they're all the same. They all get a chair, they all get a desk, they all get a computer. But in your cubicle, you have perhaps pictures of your family and a plant. Your last link to nature is that plant. By the way, Spider plants are good to have in there because they also take out some of the toxins in the environment. Uh, there's also cultural diversity described in your text is high culture, not what you think, not the way hippies live and stoners live. Get it? High, cu high culture or cultural patterns that distinguish a society's elite. Whereas pop culture, popular culture, are the cultural patterns that are widespread among a society's population. Also described is Eurocentrism, the dominance of European, especially English cultural patterns. Uh, so for example, when I ask the question, what is the world's oldest living language? People often respond with Latin or Greek or some other Western language because we're kind of ignorant, meaning we don't know any better about Eastern cultures or we don't factor that into the equation and they're just as ancient and evolved and as our African cultures, um, as our European cultures. Uh, so for example, we refer to China as the Far East, which is totally meaningless to people in China. You see, we reference us, we're the center of the world and then there's these other countries off in the periphery, for example, China over in the far east, right? But to China, that's meaningless. That's just how we reference the world given our Eurocentrism. I also think it's interesting, uh, like the Greeks, when we think about Greek knowledge and, and the great contributions Greeks have made to, to civilization and human understanding, but who taught the Greeks? Uh, the Egyptians. Where is Egypt located? Africa. So we totally underestimate the great contributions of African civilizations as well. Ethnocentrism is the practice of judging other cultures by the standards of one's own. This can occur within as well as between countries. Okay, so um, now this is often misunderstood. We confuse ethnocentrism with racism. Racism refers to, and we'll get more into this when we get to the uh, chapter on race and ethnicity, but race refers to the biological features, whereas ethnocentrism, ethnicity, refers to cultural features. So ethno ethnicity would be like um, uh, you may be an American with German heritage or, or Thai heritage or Japanese heritage or uh, Slovenian heritage or Russian heritage. That's your ethnicity. And so sometimes we'll have clash of cultures. Uh, for example, um, there will be cultures within the United States who clash with one another based on their different ethnic, different ethnicities. So this is the practice of judging other cultures by the standards of one's own. Like they don't do things the way we do it, so therefore they're wrong. Cultural relativism, everything's relative. Cultural relativism is the practice of judging a culture's by its own standards, often difficult for travelers to adopt, but more necessary than ever in our increasingly interconnected world. Okay, well, first of all, the practice of judging a culture by its own standards, this is where the hippies were largely misunderstood during their time. And I see a lot of this too with the uh, Black Lives Matters movement is they're considered to be anti-patriotic. And so you see counter protesters all carrying American flags and you know, I've often argued that it would serve the Black Lives Matter movement to also carry American flags because it is a patriotic thing to protest and to demand equal rights and equal treatment for people of color here in America. That is what America is all about. And so these are not anti-American any more than hippies were anti-American. It was saying 
America. You're not living up to your own standards. You know, the standards in the, that the founders of this country developed that are, that are uh, found in the Constitution and the, Dec and the Declaration of Independence and the, uh, all of our rights as amendments to the Constitution. So cultural relativism is the practice of judging a culture by its own standards. It doesn't mean we don't love America. It means we're calling out America for not living up to its own standards. You know, with this too, uh, may I point out how Americans are now, at least the last survey I saw, are now considered the second world's worst travelers. Uh, the French are the worst in, in the sense of worst travelers, meaning we go into other cultures and we just, other countries, and we just look down our nose at them like, I can't believe this is how they do things here. It's not how we do things back in the good old US of A. But we're still number two, so don't worry. Okay, are we heading toward a global culture? Um, well, we have several international trade agreements uh, that would seem to indicate we are heading, that we do have, in fact, a global culture. So what would be some evidence for this? Number one, the global economy, that the flow of the same consumer goods is throughout the world. You know, uh, throughout the world, everybody wants the same stuff, yeah? Um, there's worldwide advertising. Everybody wants the same stuff. Two, global communications, the flow of information through worldwide use of cell phones and the internet. So we're all seeing the same information around the world. And three, global migration, the flow of people, especially through air travel. Uh, for example, approximately 13.5% of the U.S. population was born outside of the United States. That's some 43 million people. So these three global links uh, make the cultures of the world increasingly similar. But there are three limitations to this global culture thesis. Uh, one is global flow is uneven. Uh, this global flow is more so in urban than in rural areas of the rest of the world. Also, if you really analyze it, and I have, uh, North American European cultures are influencing the rest of the world rather than the opposite. So what we are effectively doing through corporations, multinational corporations, is we're trying to export North American European culture to the rest of the world saying, hey, you should all live like us and enjoy all these wonderful products we all have and we all create. Two. It assumes everyone can afford these goods and services, which is hardly the case in the 40 or so countries that are uh, low income. And three, while common cultural practices spread, people still view the world through their own cultural lenses. For example, why do you think there's Brexit? Brexit, in case you don't know, is not a, is not a new serial. Brexit is the British leaving the European Common Union. Um, and so they don't want to be, they, you know, even when they were a part of it, they didn't, con they didn't use the, uh, the uh, euro, they used the uh, uh, British pound as their uh, monetary, for their monetary system. Uh, similarly, Switzerland, which is part of the European Common Union, continues to use the Swiss franc and not the euro. Why? Because they still see things through their own particular cultural lens and defend that culture. And so it's difficult to get all these countries in Europe to work in consort with each other because you have to always battle how the individual countries and their cultures look at things. Okay, so next we move on to on page 82, theories of culture, beginning as always with the structural functional theory. What are the functions of culture? Well, culture is a complex strategy for meeting human needs. The stability of cultural systems as they meet human needs is because they are based on core values. Again, those 10 values I said, you should memorize and understand. You know, understand them, then it's easier to memorize. Understand first, read through them, understand, go, okay, it makes sense, makes sense, makes sense. Then it's not a question just memorizing uh, like lines from a play, which who cares if you forget about them later. This is about learning, right? That you understand this and carry this knowledge and understanding on beyond this course and beyond the tests. So for example, uh, many argue the 
key value in U.S. society is individualism, uh, which plays out on that list as liberty and freedom. Individualism meaning, uh, you know, if you go back to our frontier history uh, with here were the individual families uh, trying to hack it out in the wilderness uh, and fighting off the uh, the indigenous peoples, the Native Americans who somehow thought it was their land. <laughs> if it was their land, they would have had a deed. Yes. Anyway, um, so uh, we have become, uh, we are the most individualistic society in the world, and we pride ourselves on that. Uh, so, for example, because we have a Second Amendment that says you have a right to bear arms, we have a very difficult, and that all feeds into our individualism as well, it's very difficult to pass gun control laws that were easily passed in every other uh, modern culture or society in the world. Anyway, um, so here we get into idealism based on the word ideas. So for structural functional approach to, to culture, it's based on idealism. Ideas are the basis of human reality. Now also for the exam, within the structural functional approach to culture is what are called cultural universals. Now think about the term. Universals, cultural universals mean they are found in every culture. Now they may vary as to how they're practiced. I'll give you an example, the family. There is a form of family in every known human culture. How the family works or how it's formed uh, or, or its structure or how it functions may vary from society to society, but nevertheless, a cultural universal is the family. So then the term becomes it's culturally universal, but variable. So these are traits that are part of every known human culture. For example, family, jokes. Jokes are part of every known culture. Funeral rites are part of every known culture. Uh, they evolve out of culture's attempts to meet human needs. Let me say again, evolve out of culture's attempts to meet human needs and the result in a culture's institutionalized practice of family, religion, economics, politics. Remember in the first lecture I pointed out that's what structural functionalism is all about. That it points out how as a result of figuring out, for example, how we're going to make sure we have adequate food, clothing, and shelter in society, we created a system of economics that's now not set in stone, but it's it's pretty much carried forward year after year with minor variations because that creates stability in society. So as that system has become institutionalized, it's like an institution in society, as is the family, religion, and politics. Um, the critique of this approach, oh, by the way, getting back to cultural universals, um, these are anthropologists use this all the time. Uh, now, another reason why I chose this particular text is it offers a cross-cultural perspective. Cross-cultural perspective helps us to understand human nature. So, for example, people say all the time, well, that's just human nature. And I'd say, are you sure? Or is that learned behavior? Well, if you take a course in cross-cultural analysis and cultural anthropology, you will see uh, that... Uh, whether there are cultural universals or not. So one of my favorite examples is there are cultures where competition and aggression are unknown, but people are prone to say, well, that's just human nature that people are automatically violent and aggressive and competitive. Not true. If that were true, how you wouldn't find cultures where that's unknown. So therefore it's learned behavior. So again, another value. Uh, on my part by choosing this particular text because I think it's important to have a cross-cultural perspective and everything. Okay, the critique of this approach, this structural functional approach of culture, is cultural values do not overcome all social divisions. Some values help some elements of society to the detriment of other people. And by emphasizing the stability of cultural systems, structural functionalism downplays social change that's inherent in cultures. Also, by emphasizing society's dominant values, it tends to ignore social diversity. And throughout this course, you will see it next leads us to inequality in culture, 
the social conflict theory or perspective or paradigm. Uh, this is found on page 83 in your text. Culture is a dynamic arena of social conflict generated by inequality among categories of people. The powerful shape the dominant values in a culture, which will serve their interests at the cost of the less powerful. Okay, so it's not an accident, it's purposeful. Now that sounds very abstract, but let me give you an example. Um, Think about if you go back 100 years ago in America, every little town had its own locally owned newspaper, uh, locally owned meaning the publisher, um, representing that publisher, that editor's point of view. Uh, every radio station, even if it belonged to a nationwide chain, was locally owned, representing its point of view, uh, local point of view, its take on values. Um, and so now you have almost the entire media uh, held by six major corporations or initiatives. You know, so you have Facebook, you have uh, most of the newspapers are owned by uh, one or two different publishing groups. Um, and so they represent the perspective of those owners. So instead of having a decentralized system of information of hundreds of locally owned television stations, radio stations, newspapers, now you have just about six or seven different perspectives. And that's what we think of is the way it is, you know, that that's, that gets these cultural values out to us. And so obviously they're gonna present cultural values that sustain their points of view. Uh, for example, I saw a study one time where they asked edit editors of newspapers, and editors are supposed to have free float to give whatever opinion they wish. Were they ever influenced by the owners to change their editorials? and uh, two thirds said they were. And half of them did in fact change their editorial to represent what the publisher wanted to say. So for example, the owner of Fox News is uh, Rupert Murdoch and Murdoch represents a conservative point of view. Hence Fox News is conservative in how it presents the news. So you're getting a perspective, not the objective news, you're getting a perspective on the news, the conservative perspective, just like when you watch CNN, CNN, you're getting a liberal perspective on the news. Um, okay, so with the structural functional point of view, it's not idealism, but it's materialism that, that is significant here. The ways people deal with the material world, economic forces have a powerful effect on all other dimensions of their culture. In other words, it's sort of like if we landed on a deserted island, uh, like say we're in a plane and the plane crashed, but we all safely, you know, survived the crash. Now we're on this deserted island and we may or may not get rescued. So what's gonna be our first concern? Food, clothing, and shelter. So that's what Karl Marx argued with materialism saying, the ways people deal with the material world have a powerful effect in all other dimensions of their culture. Why? Because it's the first thing we will concern ourselves with. That's also what Maslow argued in his hierarchy of needs. First is physiological survival. So if structural functionalists are correct that cultural systems address human needs. The social conflict theorists would argue that they do so unequally, which promotes change. Why? Because the haves are fewer than the have-nots. And even though the haves are trying to control the have-nots, the have-nots realize they don't have as much as the haves. And so they're always gonna be pushing for change so that they have as much as the haves do. The critique of this approach is its emphasis on cultural divisiveness and change downplays how cultural patterns do in fact bind people together. So, Again, the difference between the two is the degree of emphasis. Structural functionalism consistently emphasizes stability, that things don't change, and that there's no diversity. It's more of a homogenous approach to, to cultures in the world. Whereas social conflict point of view strictly emphasizes change, and so it's a degree of emphasis. And so again, they both have something to say. It's not as divisive as the social conflict theorists would argue, and it's not as stable as the structural functionalists would argue. Each has its degree of emphasis, but you need to know both 
in order to understand the total picture of society and culture. Next for the exam on page 83, you need to know about evolution and culture, sociobiology. Sociobiology was developed by Dr. Edward O. Wilson. It's a theoretical paradigm that studies ways in which human biological forces affect human culture. Pope Pius XII said, between God and ourselves stands nature. So the idea is that uh, many cultural decisions we make are not freely made from our own thinking, but are influenced by, out, by biological forces, whether or not we are aware of it. Uh, Dr. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson, by the way, spoke at Cedar Crest uh, commencement ceremony some years ago, and uh, he had just gotten finished uh, producing a book on ants, on ants. He thought they were absolutely fascinating. Uh, anyway, uh, for example, do you ever watch when an ant dies? If there's a bunch of ants around, the other ants will come out and they're like a mortuary squad and haul off the ant. You're like, you know, they do. They, they take care of their own. Um, anyway, so, you know, he would, this book was all about how fascinated he was by ants. And he mentioned in his lecture here uh, that, you know, after he wrote his book, people were coming up to him and say, oh, Dr. Wilson, I have ants in my home. What should I do about it? You know, meaning they were looking for a pesticide. And his response would be, be careful when you walk or you'll step on them. Okay, so what you specifically need to know is you need to know Darwin's principles of natural selection, which were on page 84, because sociobiologists build in this theory of evolution. And besides, everybody should know these anyway. So, but they're particularly uh, uh, not specific to it, but they're used by sociobiologists. So the basic premise is that premise is that living organisms change over time as a result of natural selection. So the four principles are number one, all living things live to reproduce themselves, particularly men. Two, let's see if you get that joke. Two. The blueprint for reproduction is in the genes. Three, some random variation in genes allows a species to try out new life patterns in a particular environment. This variation allows some organisms to survive better than others and pass on their advantageous genes to their offspring. Four, over thousands of generations, the genetic patterns that promote reproduction survive and become dominant Thus, a species adapts to its environment and dominant traits emerge as the nature of the organism. So the first three lead to the fourth one, which is the conclusion of Darwin's principles of natural selection. Okay, to give you an applied example, from the point of view of sociobiology, genes use bodies and societies to create more genes right? Because we're driven by, bio by biology. So the old chicken egg dilemma, which came first, the chicken or the egg, is solved in the following way, according to sociobiology. Eggs come first. Eggs use chickens to create more eggs. Okay, the critical evaluation of sociobiology. Um, some claim that it will bring back old arguments of racial or gender superiority. Um, but sociology, sociobiologists claim that it's more of a uniting factor because we all share the same evolutionary history. So what the concern is, there used to be um, arguments, uh, I think it was called phrenology. And phrenology, um, this was I think in the early 1900s, it would study the bumps on your head. And the theory was they could tell by the bumps on your head whether or not you're going to be a criminal. You know, that it's a, it's a biological aspect that you can't do anything about. You have no say in the matter. You're going to become a criminal. Um, and, you know, now we all realize how, how fallacious that approach was, but people are concerned that we're going to bring, or that to say that um, some people are innately superior to others in their intelligence. Uh, so, for example, some of those arguments go that, uh, uh, Asians are superior to, to whites uh, who are superior to people of color in intelligence, which has absolutely no factual basis whatsoever. Uh, 
but these are the arguments people are afraid sociobiology will bring back. Two, critics claim that sociobiologists have little evidence to support their theories. Humans learn behavior within a cultural system. At best, sociobiology only explains why some cultural patterns are learned more readily than others. For example, here's the cultural pattern of when it snows, we immediately have to run to the supermarket and get bread and milk. Why? I don't know. You know, it's always interesting to me when it snows, how the panic begins. You know, so first of all, they'll talk about how people are heading to the super. They always have the, the scene outside the supermarket where people are stocking up. And I have to laugh, like around here, first of all, the snowfalls are getting uh, uh, lesser and lesser because of climate change. And our winters are getting milder and milder. So even around here in my lifetime, I've never seen more than about three feet of snow. You know, and within two days, you're back to kind of getting around again. It's no big deal. But people are acting like, oh, my God, we're going to be snowed in for weeks. They're firing everything they possibly can in their cart. Again, assuming there's absolutely no food at home whatsoever. And especially you got to get the bread and the milk. Why? I don't know. Do you mean, do you watch it snow and you dip the bread in the milk? And, you know, because you got to have the bread and the milk. It's so predictable because we're nothing but a bunch of sheep. Bah. It's we're so predictable that I talked to a manager at Weiss Markets who told me that when they see a snowstorm coming in, they double down on bread milk because they know the public bah, need bread, need milk. You know, it's so true. There's actually a YouTube thing you can go check out. It's called I Gotta Get the Bread and Milk. Hey, but we think for ourselves, don't we? Nah, we do. Okay. Again, there's a table on page 84 that summarizes applying theory to culture. In other words, the two, ta the two different paradigms, perspectives, theories. Again, go look at it. If you, after reading the, this section, can then look at that table and understand it completely, not memorize it, but understand it completely, then you know the differences between the two theories. If not, go back and read the section again so that you can look at that table and go, I got this. I understand it. I understand it. So when the test question comes up, I can think it through because I understand it. You know, that book about ants reminds me of another one of Maynard's amazing anecdotes, and it's a 60s anecdote, a hippie anecdote. Of course you want to hear this one. Who doesn't want to hear a hippie anecdote? Okay, so it's back in the 60s, and uh, a friend of mine uh, rented a farm because, hey, you know, we 60s were, you know, back to nature kinds of people, we hippies, and so we had to, uh, you know, commune with nature, especially when we were doing any kind of substances. Uh, now, for me, especially any kind of psychedelic substance, I like to be outside. Anyway, so my friends and I were doing Orange Sunshine, which is a derivative of LSD. And uh, I, was, I was always a gregarious tripper. Uh, whenever I was, was high on anything, I'd just laugh my ass off. And so, um, you know, but some of my friends were different. My one friend in particular would always kind of get be by himself. Now, the, he wasn't freaking out or anything like that. He just liked the solitude. He liked to just reflect. And that's cool. You know, our, our, it was always do your own thing was our credo. And so um, it's fine. So I don't know. I was getting kind of laughed out after two hours of laughing nonstop at almost anything. Uh, and so I went over to see how my friend was doing. Now he's sitting cross-legged like this, looking straight down. Now, I didn't want to interrupt his flow, so I stood behind him, knowing that old experiment that when somebody's behind you, you eventually turn around to look. Now, my question is, if how do you know? How do you know that person's behind you? Now, we're talking about somebody could be several feet behind you, never heard the person come up, but you know somebody's staring at them. How do you know? What sense is that that you know? Just throwing that out there. Because there is an aspect to us that has these sixth sense kind of thing. Anyway, so he eventually realizes I'm there. And the following interchange takes place. He goes, whoa, ants. That's right. For two hours, he was just staring at the ground and watching the ants. 
Now, for those of you who have never engaged in taking a psychedelic substance, and I am not encouraging you to do so, let the record reflect. This is on tape. Let the record reflect that Maynard has not encouraged you, the students, or any other group of students to use drugs. He's just talking about his own experiences. Whew. Hope that checks out with my lawyers. Anyway, so you have to understand, like, when you're taking psychedelic substances like that, you, you, you're you fascinated by your entire hand. You're going, oh, my God, I got a hand. Has it always been there? Yes, look, look, I can move fingers. I can move my arm. I can direct it any way I want. Have I always been able to do this? Uh, yeah, you have been able to, Maynard. This is incredible. Look at this. We got hands. You know, some of the other things I remember is we'd have these amazing revelations when we were high and we go, oh my God, we got to write this stuff down. Oh my God, this is incredible. Oh, this is going to change the world. Then we'd read it the next morning and go, what is this gibberish? Oof. Anyway, that's the story of the ants. Please hold your applause for the end. Oh, that was the end. Okay, well then applaud. Okay. Let's end this chapter with another quote, shall we? And it's a long quote, but this comes under the heading, is, is culture a constraint or does it provide us with freedom? Peter Berger, sociologist who I quote often said, people can say no to society and often have done so. There may be very unpleasant consequences if they take this course. They may not even think about it as a possibility because they take their own obedience for granted. Their institutional character may be the only identity they can imagine having, with the alternative seeming like a leap into madness to them. This does not change the fact that the cultural statement, I must, is a deceptive one in almost every social situation. So are you going to think for yourself? Or are you going to be simply a product of culture? That's up to you. And while you think about that, that's the end of chapter three. I'll see you soon with chapter four.